So I'm going to be discussing the national scene. And the myth that I'm going to be busting is the myth that um, it's a big one. It's just the idea that we're making any kind of progress in the number of women elected. And, uh, you know, we all have this idea we're making steady progress, things are getting better. No, they're not, in fact. We're not making any progress in the number of women elected. And in fact, in 2006, we came pretty close to a collapse nationally, back to early 1980 levels in the number of women elected. So let me run through some figures very quickly for you. I've got way too much material, so we're going to have to go back if you have any further questions here. Here's a baseline for uh, where we are in terms of the proportion of women elected to the House of Commons in Canada. And that's going back to 1970. And you can see that there were rapid increases in the 1980s. And then beginning in the early mid-1990s, we reached a plateau. And we have been stuck there since about 1997 nationally. They had a little bump up in the last election, but nothing. So, you know, it's really, you know to drive this point home to you, just consider since uh, since 2000, the number of tremendous changes that we've had in the composition of governments. Since 2000, we have had a Jean Chrétien minority landslide government. Then in 2003, we had the merger of the Reform and the Progressive Conservatives. 2004, we had uh, a Paul Martin minority Liberal government. 2006, minority Conservative government, and then a we and then a stronger minority conservative government in 2008. So these tremendous changes in political organization, electoral outcomes, and meanwhile, stagnation, inertia. So what's going on? I'm going to try and take you behind that inertia and show you some of the factors that are behind the scenes, and there's a, a tremendous amount of tumult going on here. Okay, what we have to do is I'm going to be talking a lot about candidacies here tonight, and you can see that there's been a real increase in the number of candidacies. In fact, since 2000, we've had a 46% increase in the proportion of candidates running. But even with all this major <coughs> increase in the number of candidates running, we might say a real increase in the women friendliness of the parties we've uh, scarcely added a bump in terms of the number of women elected. We've gone from 62 MPs in 2000 to 69 MPs. So what's going on? Why haven't those candidates generated the kind of outcome in the House of Commons? Well, the first thing we have to do is look at the nature of candidacies. Now, this is um, the number of candidates for the major political parties and I've divided them up into three categories here. First of all, we've got the incumbents on the bottom, the smallest category. And generally, incumbents can expect to be renominated and to be re-elected most of the time. And incumbency has its own value. I'm not going to be objecting to incumbency altogether. Now, the next category are the non-incumbent hopefuls. And on top of that, the vast bulk of candidates. These are lost cause candidates. Candidates, um, and this is just as many men as are women. Most candidates are running for a part. They're running in a race which they have no expectation of winning. So the really critical category that we're going to have to look at here is the non-incumbent hopeful candidates. These are candidates that uh, have won, that win at least half as many votes as the winner. Okay, they're not, it's not a close race or a tight race, but it's in a race that they expect to win. If they don't win this time, they expect their party to win in the next election. So these are the agents of change, the non-incumbent hopeful candidates. So once I've made that distinction, let's look at it for women. Going on here, we can see that most of the women candidates since 2000 have been lost cause candidates. In fact, 36% of all women candidates in 2008 were running for lost cause races. Now, most of those, and it's not as if women are preferentially sacrificial lambs. That's another myth that's worth busting. We used to say sacrificial lambs without all these gender connotations, but uh, the better term is lost cause. But it's not mostly women. I mean, it's not preferentially women. The story here with this figure is that most of those lost cause candidates are running for the NDP nationally. Okay? And that's because the NDP 
does not run as many competitive races across the country as do the Liberals and the Conservatives, okay? But within that category, there are as many women as there are men in DP. So, let's look more carefully in the rest of this presentation to those hopeful, competitive candidates which have increased. And break it down by party here a bit more. You can see that the New Democrat Party, as a social democratic party of the left, is the most woman-friendly of all the parties. It runs consistently more women as candidates. The Bloc Quebec Law, and then the Liberals are also up there. And then down at the bottom, we have the Conservatives running the fewest number of women candidates. So I'm going to be referring to them as a party that is less friendly to women. Um, Uh, the Liberal Party has been consistently high in running candidates. A lot of this goes back to Jean Chrétien when he first ran the election in 1993. He used his prerogative as leader to appoint women candidates, to just put them into safe Liberal seats across the country. Maybe remember Georgette Sheridan in Saskatoon was one of these. Then again, Paul Martin did not make those kind of explicit formal commitments, but he again, there was pressure within the party to keep appointing women candidates. And then finally, in Stéphane Dion, in fact, he promised one-third women, and he did more than one-third. He exceeded his goal. And they weren't sacrificial lambs either. The part that really impresses me here is, um, in fact, as the Liberal Party was sliding in popularity in 2008, the number of districts that it could expect to win was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. At the same time, the proportion of women was increasing in those competitive districts. And I think that speaks to something in the party, that even within that diminishing circle of prize competitive districts, more of them were going towards women. Okay. That's the situation with the Liberals, the NDP. So what's the story with the Conservatives? Exactly what is their position? Well, in fact, there is no published position. There has been nothing stated on the record. This is the only thing I've been able to find. This is uh, personal correspondence that Stephen Harper wrote to journalist uh, Rosemary Spears in 2004, soon after being elected leader of the Canadian Alliance Party. I can't really read it. I can do my best Stephen Harper impression for you. Yes, yeah, go ahead. I, I can't do it. Um, well, <laughs> while we recognize the importance of having men and women of diverse backgrounds in our party, we are firmly committed to ensuring that the responsibility for selecting candidates in the ridings remains with our grassroots members. As a result, women who are successful in our party owe their success to their own hard work. Alright, so that's that's it for the record. So we're looking at what kind of consequences that point of view has for the proportion of women elected to the House of Commons. And as backdrop again, it's worth looking at the shifting fortunes of the Liberal and the Conservative Party. During the past eight years, the Conservatives have gone from being hopeful or competitive in roughly one half to three quarter of Canada's electoral districts. The Liberals have gone from being hopeful in over 80% of districts to just one half of the districts. And what sort of implications has this had for women candidates? Here we go. Okay. I've made the point before. Even under diminishing circumstances, the Liberals continued to put women into prize seats. On the other hand, something truly anomalous was happening within the Conservative Party. Their lost cause candidates rose in tandem with the other parties, but look at what happened to their hopeful districts in 2006. The number, and this is in the context of the 2006 election, when they're about to be elected, the number of districts in which they were hopeful kept expanding and expanding. But that expanding array of competitive districts were going to men candidates. Meanwhile, the conservative women were stranded in those lost cause races. That was exceptional in 2006. And if the conservatives had taken more seats in 2006, we would have been put back to early 1984, mid-1980s levels in the number of women elected. All right, there's no steady progress. We, may, we came very close to our numbers just plummeting. Then something happened in 2008. According to Stephen Harper, women get elected by their own hard work. Okay, I guess they just worked a lot harder in 2008 because there were more women riding and running in better ridings and they were getting elected more in 2008. Breaking it down by the parties. Okay, 
it's a number of hopeful women candidates by parties. So even as the Liberal Party was diminishing in its competitiveness, the Liberal gaps were compensated for by the expanding number of NDP women running in good races. And the Conservatives expanded a bit in 2008. Oh, I can't see that figure. What is that? Oh, this is the success rate. I just wanted to drive home. This is another myth that voters won't vote for women candidates, and that's a myth as well. Because once we look at the party competitiveness, then we can see that women are just as competitive as men. Okay? Okay, what we have to look at here is the relationship between the non incumbents and the incumbents. And this explains here that it used to be most of the women elected were incumbents, that crew of Jean Chrétien appointees. By 2008, most of them were newcomers. They were running more precarious races that they weren't guaranteed to win. Now, so incumbency is the major factor. Now, let's look at incumbency. Since 2000, over the elections I've studied here, the turnover rate was 23%. That is, 23% of the seats in the House of Commons became open to newcomers. 77% of the MPs could it were re-elected. So, we're looking at only 23% are really open to change. And that progress in new candidacies takes time to show up in the House. So, that bottom line there shows 28.8%. And that, 20, that is the proportion of hopeful candidates that were elected, the number of women elected into the House of Commons. Now, with the 23% turnover rate, let's imagine that half of all newcomers had to be women. We created a government legislation, all half, only half could be women. Now, we would reach parity at that point in 2016. Let's move into the realm of feminist fantasy and imagine that from now on, only women can be candidates, and women only. <laughs> At that point, we would reach par we would reach parity sooner. But I mean, this just there. Oh, got mixed up on my figures. Yeah, we would reach parity. We would be above parity in 2016. Even with half, we would only be at parity at 40 percent. So my point here that I will leave you with. Um, I will leave you with my summary of points. Everything rests upon the conservative women candidates, and it is an open question whether they can continue their advances in 2008 in the absence of any kind of stated principle that this is even a good idea in the first place. Thank you, Louise.